We've heard about resource constraints today um, and the challenges of pediatric settings and of care for older people as well. So how do we make our practice more person-centered within the constraints of institutions, of existing cultures, which we've just heard about, um, and the resource constraints on our health and care system? Well, I'm really delighted to welcome Brendan McCormack, who's going to have a go at um, giving us some answers to those very difficult questions about how you make person-centered practice a reality. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to Mark and colleagues for asking me uh, to do this uh, talk. I appreciate I'm coming close to standing between you and your gin, um, so um, I'll try and make it as, as light, light as possible. I should say something about my chosen track, uh, which is meant to be, I guess, the, the, my final track that I won't even hear. Um, but uh, it's actually the track that um, signifies when my partner and I met 12 years ago in Australia. And one of the lines is it, uh, in it is, uh, I'm, I'm a little special. And all our friends thought it said, I'm with the professor. Um, <laughs> and, and from there on in, it's uh, become known as I'm with the professor song. Uh, so we met uh, 12 years ago on Monday, and we get married on Saturday. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, and in my usual limited style of being organized, I'll um, sort that out tomorrow. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I was asked to come and talk about uh, the, how we can make person-centered uh, practice a reality. And uh, I guess if I knew the answer to that, then I would probably be in a much higher paid job uh, than I am right now, um, and you would all be doing it. Um, and so the reality of making it a reality, I think, is the, is the biggest challenge. Um, but what I want to do in the uh, time that I have uh, is to really talk a little bit about person-centeredness and what we really mean by that, because it has to be one of the most misunderstood words uh, within our health and social care uh, work these days. And then to um, talk a bit about some of the um, kind of work that I'm engaged in, but more importantly, some of the things that drive me around how we uh, deal with issues of person-centeredness and how we make it more of an, an everyday reality. So um, there's a theory light on the basis that it is an afternoon and a uh, high sleep strategy. Um, so hopefully there will be some, uh, some things in here that will, will keep you awake for 45 minutes before the singing, which will be a good way to, good way to end. Um, Person-centeredness has become a very commonly used phrase within, within health and social care. Um, and I'm not really expecting you to read the detail on this, other than this is the framework for person-centered and integrated health care that the World Health Organization now use to uh, shape all of their developments in health care around the world. Um, and what is really interesting about this is that the uh, World Health Organization's approach is what they call people-centered and integrated health care. So it is about put, putting the person as, the, as in terms of population uh, at the center of decision making. But in their, their framework, they hold the person, as in the person of the service user, at the heart of all of the, the planning and all of the work that they're engaged in. And I think what is both exciting and incredibly challenging about this are, are twofold, really. One is the excitement is that it really does blow out of the water this myth that person-centeredness means this very individualistic, one-to-one -one thing that only applies to the person in the bed or in the chair or wherever direct care is being given, because that isn't what person-centeredness is about. Um, and as you can see from this framework, it is actually goes from individual through to team to through to community, through to whole populations, that those same principles and values hold, hold through. Um, and the, the other challenge of it is, of course, that they are applying this thinking to all kinds of nations around the world. Person-centeredness has historically and traditionally been something that's talked about in rich Western nations, where we can afford to think about how we, how we might be, be cared for. But in more developing countries and middle-income countries, that's not always been a luxury. Um, and certainly many of the, the healthcare systems haven't developed around the particular needs of persons or, or communities. And recently I was doing some work with uh, the Malaysian Ministry for Health using this framework to help them design a person-centered primary care system. And when you think about we think about our community nursing and the challenges we have, whereas we were trying to look at how do we make a person-centered service for you know, nurse practitioners working in a rural clinic where to see 500 patients a day. Um, it's a slightly different challenge to how we might care for a caseload of 20 people or something. Um, but the same principles apply, and I think that is what's exciting about it, because it really challenges us to think beyond busyness, uh, resources, but really at the level of, of principle. 
The second thing is that most of the um, talk around person-centeredness to me is incredibly superficial. It's all about whether we give people choices or not, as if somehow we own all the choices that people can have. Um, and as I've you know, always uh, argued in our work, that if we say we can give somebody a choice, then of course we can equally take it away just as fast. Um, and person-centeredness is much deeper than that. It's actually about, about the, whole, the whole person. And uh, for those of you who may have read the book The Little Prince, um, I hope you have. Uh, if you haven't, you need to go and uh, hide your daughter away and steal her book. Um, because The Little Prince is this wonderful story of, of how do we kind of position ourselves in life. It's a philosophy, it's a, it's a metaphor and fable. But um, what it is about is essentially how do we get at the deeper essence of the person? Who are we? What are we actually about? And of course, the last line of this is really the most important thing, which is what is most important is invisible. And what we know to all of us is that what is most important is invisible. It's not me standing here as I look. It's not necessarily what I'm saying. It's not how you are sitting looking at me right now in various guises of interest and boredom. Um, or it's none of that. It's actually some of those deeper feelings, uh, those deeper connections that you are and we are continuously making and which shape and reshape our lives every day. And when we think about service users, of course, that is the reality for them as well. And we will, we will come back to that in a minute. The third thing I wanted to say is that person-centeredness isn't just about patient care. I do want to say a whole hour-long talk about the way we use the phrases person-centered care and patient-centered care interchangeably as if they are the same thing when they are completely not the same thing. Um, but, and I would ask you to, to think about that distinction. But we have for a very long time argued that when we talk about person-centeredness, we aren't just talking about the care that patients or service users uh, or families or communities receive, but we are also talking about the culture within which staff and people delivering care actually work in. Um, and our research would be very clear in showing that unless we pay attention to a person-centered culture, we never actually get person-centered care. Um, and we see a huge amount of this kind of uh, contradiction going on within our health services development uh, at the minute, really, where there is a huge emphasis and a whole variety of policy documents, standards, various statements, uh, various approaches to delivering care, which is all about person-centeredness. And and only the work around how do we actually create a culture where staff can feel well is only starting to really come into play without recognition that actually the only way you get to that person-centered care is by ensuring that you have a staff workforce who also appreciate and experience the values of person-centeredness for themselves and for each other. So we have always defined person-centeredness as being something that's broader than about care delivery. And in fact, I rarely talk about person-centered care as a thing these these days, I usually only talk about person-centered cultures because care delivery is a, an element, a element of that culture. And the other key part of this definition is that it is relational. Yeah, you will also see in the literature quite a debate about is relationship-centered care the same as person-centered care? Is it better than person-centered care? Is it different to? And really, I find the argument a bit trite. Um, fundamentally, relationships are fundamental part of being a person. So how we think we can separate out relationships from a person-centered approach is kind of beyond my philosophical understanding. Um, and um, for me, um, health, healthful relationships are a critical part of what we're trying to do when we're talking about person-centeredness. Healthfulness uh, is a phrase that comes from the uh, ethicist David Seathaus, who talks about the fact that um, we have to be able to, if we're going to be moral and ethical, be able to give healthfulness to other people. That actually we have to pay attention to our own health, and in doing so, we give healthfulness to other people through our connections and through our relationships. And that is the basis of being a morally good person. Um, and that is also the basis of being a healthy person, that we are able to see uh, being healthy in that broadest way. So for me, person-centeredness is fundamentally about a healthfulness, a state of well-being, um, and a state of flourishing, which I will come back to uh, later. And of course, there are a whole set of conditions that enable that to happen, uh, which are very values-based, very principles-based, that we need to have in place. And the important thing about this is it's, to achieve a person-centered culture is not about doing lots of stuff. It's not about bringing lots of changes into place. It's actually about how we connect, how we communicate, how we relate, uh, how we actually create an ethos uh, where we have a fundamental belief about the value of persons. And that may seem 
seem like a very obvious thing to say, but I think if we all stopped for a second and reflected on many of our own settings, we would say that the value of persons may be uh, disputable uh, in terms of how people are actually treated um, and how they actually engage and how they work. We've done a lot of work developing a framework, and I'm really not going to spend any time on this because uh, it is the rest, of the rest of the talk. But just to really, it's a way of emphasizing that um, what we are trying to do, if we believe this idea that person-centeredness is more than uh, just the delivery of patient care, but it is about a whole culture, then we have to pay attention to person-centeredness at all levels of the system. It can't just be an expectation um, that you know, care workers go in and are person-centered in their approach and are kind and caring and compassionate, but actually we don't pay attention to the rest of the system and how that system might enable them to do so. And there's big societal uh, issues in that. One of my uh, PhD students in Norway has just finished her PhD looking at how the government decision making enables or disables person-centered decision making among home care workers. And of course the reality is they disable it. They talk about it, uh, but then every decision that they make kind of goes against that talk and then goes against how home care workers are able to deliver care to quite vulnerable older people living in isolated communities in a way that truly respects them as persons, which of course compromises her as a person uh, and the way she is able to work. So there are huge agendas in terms of how we, how we move this on. Um, in that macro context, the way we're going through health and social care integration at the moment is a huge agenda for us in, in person-centered care. How do we try and still hold those communities, communities who really need an integrated approach from us without us getting caught up in reorganization of systems and the reorganization of teams? Because actually, the reality is the person is in great danger of getting lost in the middle of that. Uh, we would argue very strongly that the starting point of being person-centered for all of us is knowing ourselves. Who, who am I as a person? What is it that makes me get out of bed in the morning and do the work that I do? What is it that makes me get out of, of bed in the morning and do the kind of challenging experiences that I have to connect it with day after day, eight hours a day? Um, and when we think about that, then we can start to think about some of the challenges and some of the reasons why some people aren't able to stay being person-centered in their work. Um, I would buy any of us to do four 12-hour shifts continuously and remain 100% person-centered in that process. Um, I'm not sure any of us actually would, uh, and I know for sure I couldn't do that without a huge network uh, of systems and support to enable me uh, to stay strong in those really challenging, challenging moments. In terms of the environment, there's a huge amount of work, and particularly in a, in a palliative and end-of-life care context, being done around the physical environment. Um, how do we actually make our environments more conducive to persons, where they're less clinical and more connecting with the person, person themselves? Um, and there's been some really huge work uh, done around that that is really quite exciting, because it actually starts to, um, as Margaret Hanna uh, describes, it starts to humanize healthcare. It starts to put the human first, uh, and then the essence of care coming after that. But when we look at this level of the context, the care environment, the setting in which we are, we are all working, then there are again many challenges for us to pay attention to. Um, in a lot of the development work that I do with teams, um, then most of it is really around team relationships, effective communication, how people make decisions, how we work with hierarchies, uh, who's not or is bullying who, um, and how are those relationships actually managed uh, to prevent people from being destroyed in their work and to enable a much more healthful care environment. Um, and certainly, when I see many of the clinical settings that I work in, then there are huge challenges to maintain that at a level that people can feel well, uh, given that they are in a constant change uh, situation. The person-centered processes are really about how we work with people. How do we work with service users, with communities? Um, how do we hold their beliefs and values uh, central? I came into the work at the end of the workshop on uh, advanced care planning, and of course, the essence of that is how do we hold somebody's beliefs about how they want to die um, at the end? How do we hold that and actually make that central to all of our decision making that we have at the point at which they, they come to us? And of course, it's a good example of the systems not enabling it because, of course, all the way along, there are particular bumps that can prevent that from being held. No matter how strongly we feel about the importance of the values that person has, how do we cross those bumps and hold that person as they go, to go through it? 
And lastly, um, for us, we have uh, now got about 10 years worth of data just managing these or measuring these four outcomes because we have moved away from things like uh, measuring patient satisfaction because it's pretty meaningless when it comes to uh, whether your care has been person-centered or not. Uh, we have moved away from measuring staff satisfaction uh, because it's pretty meaningless uh, in terms of saying anything uh, about whether people are happy in their job or not. Um, and what we do know is that experience data is much stronger than all of that data. And experience data can come through more quantitative measures, but it also comes through the stories that people tell on a day-to-day -day basis. And how we systematically collect those stories is also a real challenge for us. Um, there's some really good practice in this field, but there's also some dodgy practice in this field where people might collect one or two stories and think that that's going to be the essence of their whole change strategy. Mm, probably not. Uh, but it gives us some insight into some experiences that we can build on and we can start to really shape what it is that we're doing. So I just wanted to present this because I think what I hope it starts to do is open our minds when we think about the reality of person-centeredness because the reality of person-centeredness is that if we are going to embrace it, we have to think it as much more broadly than how we deliver direct patient care, which is where the majority of the literature still sits uh, and where there is still a majority of the, of the emphasis. In our work in 2013, uh, this is work that my colleague Tanya McCants and I did, we did an evaluation of our own studies to say, um, what is actually going on here? You know, are we after, at that point, I think we're about 15 years at it, and thinking, feel a bit tired, and have we made any difference? Um, the answer to that was a little bit, um, but not a huge amount. And what we concluded from a review of our own kind of research studies was to say most people in our health and social care systems experience what we described as person-centered moments. They have moments throughout a, a day or a period of care where they feel valued, they feel loved, uh, they feel like a genuine person. And then they have big chunks of time in between those moments where they don't feel that. They feel like a thing. Uh, they feel like they're having things done to them, uh, that their, their views aren't necessarily being taken into account, um, and that these are kind of the ones that they remember. And we did this through looking at hundreds and hundreds of, of patient and staff stories uh, that we had collected through a variety of projects. And there was this um, trend that you could see running through it of people having these glimmers where they genuinely got what this kind of person-centered thing was, where they felt like a person, and then huge periods where they didn't, they didn't feel like that. And and some of the reasons why that was happening are, are on, these, on these slides. And what is interesting about this, I think, and what we kind of try to argue is that this isn't about money. This isn't about resources necessarily, but it is about what we prioritize, what it is that we see as most important within a within a day to day day to day practice. And uh, a lot of the work that we do around this, working with teams, it can often start with money and resources. And yes, somewhere along the line there might be an issue about that, but it's rarely the starting point. Uh, it is usually about how our ways of working have evolved over over years and maybe maybe not necessarily changed. Um, how we have become entrenched in some ways of, ways of being. Um, and even though we may not think that we're quite, quite routined, the reality is that most of our settings are quite routine. Um, and we have to really stand back and look at them quite, quite critically. Uh, Vicky Entwistle and Watt did some really interesting work a few years ago that I think is really important because it fits with the idea of, of building on people's strengths. And if we think about, um, for us to do a more kind of in-depth presentation of some of the reasons why person-centeredness might not be happening, um, one of the arguments is that we need to build more on people's strengths, on their capabilities and what they are capable of doing. And in all of the, the work that we do, one of the things that is so amazing is watching the capability that people have that lie dormant, uh, the creativity that they have, and the, the things that they can possibly do that they're not necessarily doing, doing at the moment. Um, and I think uh, this idea of looking at people's capabilities is a really powerful way of making person-centered practice um, and person-centered cultures much more real. They argue that there are um, three personal capabilities, so they're capabilities that apply to persons. And the first one is about respect and compassion. Again, it's interesting how compassion has become such a buzzword uh, within, within healthcare, um, but actually, again, compassion, just like relationships, is a fundamental part of paying attention to the person. Uh, it's not separate to it, it is about an essence of, of being a person. 
They also argue that we have to pay attention to subjective experience, to be able to really hear people's stories and to understand what that means for how we, we can engage effectively. And lastly is the idea of supporting for autonomy. Um, autonomy has almost become a dirty word within, within the professions because you know, it means we can be let loose and do what we like without being controlled. Um, but actually that's not what autonomy is. Autonomy is about being able to make decisions at the time you need to make them in a framework that supports you to do so, but knowing the accountabilities that you carry for it. Um, and again, I think some, we have to rethink some of the systems that we have in place that have, have put more and more controls over people that in a way erode that autonomy and prevent that from actually happening. And again, something we need to pay attention to. But fundamentally, after all of that, what I believe in most is that if we are being person-centered, then we are flourishing. We are flourishing as, as a human being. And I guess this is where most of my work sits at the minute, is how do we help everybody to flourish and to really flourish as a, hum as a human being? The word flourishing was originally coined by Aristotle, it's believed, um, who talked about it as, as happiness. But um, when, when you translate all of his work on, on happiness, it really is about human flourishing. How do, how do we people, people really stay, stay alive? Of course, the opposite to flourishing is languishing. And uh, very few of us, I guess, want to say, oh yes, I'm happily languishing. Um, it's not necessarily a, a state that we all want to admit to, really. Um, which, of course, is the same with person-centeredness. It's very difficult for anybody to say, no, I'm not person-centered. Uh, which is the first barrier we come to in terms of, of uh, how, we, how we move forward. But human flourishing is really about when we're at our best, when we're energetic, when we feel connected, when we feel that we have got energy for, for what we're doing, uh, when we feel passionate about what we're doing, when people feel loved, when they feel cared for, uh, when they feel that fundamentally they're alive. Um, and my experiences, and particularly in my own, my own um, clinical area, which is mostly residential long-term care, um, this is a huge challenge for people, both for staff and for residents and families, uh, to try and keep a sense of flourishing going within those communities, because the work can be challenging, it can be heavy, uh, it can be hard going. Um, and to try and keep a sense where people are continuously energetic is a real problem um, and one that we have to do a huge amount of work uh, to, make, to make that happen. And I'm not suggesting practice is bad, it's just that that is a, is a big challenge. And I think it's a challenge in many of our particular settings. So what I'm particularly interested in is how do we create the conditions for people to flourish? How do we actually help all of us in our work and all of the service users that, that we connect with, whatever way that we connect with them, uh, to actually flourish and to be the best that they can be in the way that they want, they want to be. And it does require us to, to think, uh, I think, quite differently about how we might view change, how we might view what we're developing, what we're focusing on, um, and to start exploring, I think, some different avenues for connecting people within, it, within our services. And so I just want to, uh, as the kind of third, last part of my presentation, to talk through these eight principles that we've been working on and, and developing now through our research over the last couple of years. They're still very tentative, but uh, they seem to carry uh, in a variety of ways, which is always very, very helpful. The first one is a question, and I would also ask you to kind of reflect as this goes through about uh, what do these principles mean to you where you work um, and how you support perhaps and manage, manage people. Um, in terms of how do we bound and frame our practice, what this really refers to is what do we prioritize? What do we give greatest priority to in our practice? Um, my experience often is that the person-centered bit gets done when the rest of it is finished. Um, you know, so we have our routine in the morning, or we have our routine that we, this list of tasks that we have to get through, and then we think about all the other bits that kind of surround them. Um, and if we bound and frame our practice like that, then of course we will have person-centered moments. Uh, we will not have these connections that hold, hold people together. And in that is this idea about what do we put in the background of our practice and what do we put in the foreground? So what do we really hold up front as being the essence of our practice? Do we hold the technical competence, the cure, care kind of, kind of um, approach, or do we actually hold all of the knowledge, all of the knowing of that person that is driving our decision making in the foreground and that everything else comes, comes after it? And I was reminded of this recently in my own practice, so I do some shifts up in NHS Fife uh, in Kirkcaldy, and I was working with a nurse practitioner in training, 
Um, and it was fantastic. Uh, relatively newly graduated nurse who was straight on to the uh, nurse practitioner program, FAB. Um, and I was working with them all morning, and it was a joy. Um, and one of these interactions just really grabbed me. And uh, in a paper I was doing recently, I, I kind of wrote it as a very short narrative. Um, I just thought I'd read it as an example of backgrounding and foregrounding. It goes, Sean is an advanced nurse practitioner in training. It's only two years since he graduated from his undergraduate nursing program. He assesses older people who are frail and plans care programs for them that are genuinely holistic and person-centered. Mary, an older woman transferred from a care home, is not allowed to eat or drink due to the need for further investigations, a decision made much earlier in the day by a medical consultant. Sean meets with Mary and determines that she should be able to eat and drink and that keeping her fasting is inappropriate. He connects with Mary through his very being and determines that the thing Mary most wants in life at this moment is a, quote, glass of cold milk. There were a few swear words in there as well. Um, and that becomes Sean's mission. He assesses Mary and ensures that he has all his evidence in place. He engages the consultant and in minutes, Mary is sitting up drinking a glass of cold milk. The emotion that passes through Sean and Mary is profound. She says, you are a lifesaver, son. And there was a few swear words in there as well. <laughs> and he said, you enjoy your milk. And it was a brilliant example of a nurse practitioner whose role is to really focus on that technical, but actually for a whole half hour, all that became his focus was making sure she got a glass of milk. And for me, that is the essence of how do we move between the background and the foreground of what's important in our, in our practice. The second principle is that of coexistence, and um, some of the work that is happening currently around this idea of cultures of kindness, I think, really interests me. Um, I actually believe that many of our settings are relatively unkind. We're, we're often unkind to each other. Uh, we have unkind principles that expect things from people that we would never expect from normal human beings in normal, in normal circumstances. And I think we really have to address this issue about kindness. It's not a dirty word, it's a nice word. Um, and it, it is a, a, a profound part of human nature that we can fundamentally start with being kind to each other. So what is it that um, makes some of our settings unkind? What is it that actually knocks that kindness out of us uh, when we're busy on a day-to-day -day basis? I believe very strongly that some of that is about the connections that we have, that we don't pay attention to some of the connections that we have with each other on a day-to-day -day basis, and that we need to reinstate them. And I'm going to uh, embarrass, I think, some of my colleagues from Marie Curie uh, here. I hope not. Um, but we've been doing some work in, in Marie Curie that I think feeds into, into this really nicely. And one of the initiatives that uh, was launched there was the newsletter of introducing new staff. So new staff do a collage of who they are as a person, which was a, an activity we, we did as a development group. And then they write a short narrative about themselves, about who they are as a person. And what I think has been really interesting about that is a very simple kind of initiative, but quite brave and courageous one, um, is that it actually you see beyond that front of the person. You see beyond the administrator, you see beyond the consultant, you see beyond whoever it is, and you see the person. And it's a very different starting point uh, to start developing connections on which then you build uh, important therapeutic relationships. You probably can't read all of that um, narrative, and uh, she probably, Wilma probably is very pleased <laughs> that you can't read all of that either. <laughs> The third principle, oops, gone back again, um, is about uh, the known and yet to be known. One of the things that I think we place a lot of emphasis on, and uh, there's a long kind of philosophy behind this, is that we talk a lot about what we know and what we don't know. Um, in our work, we talk about what we don't, what we know, and what we have yet to know, because if it is about yet to know, then it's always a state of becoming. It's always a state of what can I try and find out next that can, can really, really help me. If we do that, then of course it's not about compliance, it's about innovation. And there is a huge emphasis in our healthcare system currently on compliance. Um, and of course, if we are focused on compliance, then we can't be a focus on innovation at the same time, because what we want is to ensure that people are complying and conforming to the rules and regulations that are, that are in place. So how do we, in our care settings, actually make room for, yes, a safe environment, of course, but one where staff can genuinely use their autonomy to be innovative and creative and energetic? Um, and that goes back to to the deep levels that I see many staff have that lie dormant uh, within their everyday, everyday work. 
If we look at some of the writing that's coming out of service improvement work at the moment, there is starting to be quite a big challenge to this, and I'm delighted about that. Um, because the challenge is to say, data isn't enough. We cannot just continue to produce run charts uh, and small acts of change and think that we're going to change culture and think that we're going to uh, change a profound experience that pe people might have. Uh, Don Berwick, uh, in a recent talk, in the last bullet uh, line comes from him, has now started to argue that the only way we can learn is through practice if we're going to get sustainable cultures of quality, that we can't just continue to kind of do these, these data-based tasks we have to have these cultures of quality. Uh, I was running a workshop for CISC uh, recently on compassion and quality improvement, and one of the, uh, we did it totally creatively the whole day, and one of the uh, groups did this brilliant presentation on uh, compassion in, a, in an emergency department, and they did it on the basis of measuring compassion through a run chart. Um, and it was fantastic, as they, you know, you've shown X moments of compassion, you go up a line, uh, you're doing really well. But what it showed was the ridiculousness of that kind of thinking when we're talking about relationships and talking about connecting with people. So I'd ask us to think about, about that. I can see Bridget from here. And I think, uh, again, in uh, the Marie Curie work, um, this is some of the work that we were doing. And this is Bridget, who's just down there, um, holding one of the, the uh, posters that, that we were doing. And the last line of it, again, I think, is the really important bit, which is that person-centeredness is the mortar that holds us all together. So we can have all of these activities happening. We can have all of these projects. But we also need to think about where we place the person as the mortar, as the glue that keeps all of these working together. We also need to think about the conflicting energies. All our settings aren't, you know, all lovey-dovey and we all sit around loving each other all day. They're far from it. Um, but we can think about how do we use that energy positively? How do we manage conflict within our team? How do we deal with crisis in our team rather than something that becomes a mega um, issue that we no longer speak to each other about? Um, how do we actually deal with that as something that has to be discussed, has to be worked with? Um, there's a whole story to tell of this from my own practice practice within Queen Margaret University, actually. We have now two and a half years in to changing some of the culture uh, that we work in to one that is much more person-centered. And a lot of this has been about dealing with conflict. How do we have conversations that don't result in a whole host of conflict? And it takes a lot of hard work to actually achieve it. Central to that is leadership, and this is a framework that's been developed by uh, another one of my PhD students in the Netherlands, actually, uh, Sean Cardiff, who did his PhD looking at person-centered leadership. And there's kind of too much in this to, to take on, but what he essentially argued was that the leader has to hold this idea of presencing, communing, uh, contextualizing, sensing, and balancing, and that that's the fundamental role of a person-centered leader, is to hold all of these these things in balance, which is a huge leadership challenge uh, for most normal, normal human beings. The fifth principle is that of being still. How do we create stillness uh, in our workplace? Of course, now the buzzword is to be mindful, uh, and everybody is being mindful. Um, and you may have had a mindfulness session today, I don't know if you did, uh, because it's become pretty normal to have a minute of mindfulness uh, in these kind of situations. And I'm not knocking or mocking that in any way, because for me personally it's a really important practice. But that's the important thing, is how does it become an important practice, not something that is, is tagged on uh, to, to everyday work. But there is no doubt that we have to create more stillness within our care settings, where people can stop and think and actually have a conversation that enables them to refocus on what they are, what they are doing. Um, Peter Jarvis, who's a social scientist some years ago, said that if we are going to place the person in whatever context that is at the center of our practice, we have to make a clear distinction between what he referred to as the busyness of practice versus the business of practice. And the business of practice is thoughtful, reflective, focused, uh, still practice. It's not running around after our tails thinking, what am I going to do next? It's actually stopping and really thinking that through. Six is embodying contrasts. And uh, of course, the really important thing here is, is um, creating balance. How do we actually create uh, balance and actually work with contrast? Because it's all very well having a shared vision, having shared values, but actually we want some difference in there too. We want some people who are a bit edgy, we want some people who are a bit challenging, and we want people who won't just take it all, take it all for granted. But we also have to think about that in the way that we, we design services. And again, uh, I was thinking about that recently. I was reading this book called Dear Dementia. Um, I don't know if any of you have 
you've read it, which is a, a book of short lines from people living with dementia and, um, and kind of some of their experiences. And the one that really jumped out at me in, in this context was this one. And it's this woman, and she says, Dear Dementia, so they're all people who are writing to their dementia as if it was a person. Um, Dear Dementia, my new care home copied my old front door. I don't know if you get that, but there's a tendency in, in care home design to normalize the setting by putting in doors that look like normal front doors. So my new care home copied my old front door. I thought it was a lovely idea, but every time I open it, it promises so much and delivers only heartbreak. So it really kind of stuck in terms of heartbreak because what it suggests is it's not enough to just kind of do these superficial acts of the front door or whatever these emblems might be or what, what has been referred to by Shine as these kind of uh, artifacts of a positive culture. We have to go behind those. And of course, if you are going to put a positive front door on that looks normal, but behind it is a traditional nursing home setting, then that's cheating. And actually, it's not very helpful uh, to helping somebody live uh, a life that helps them to hold a contract of what they're doing. Seven is the harmony, is that we do need to get harmony in all of this. So I would ask you to think about how do you kind of do this kind of work alongside everything else, but without making it a big deal. Um, Person-centered work should just naturally integrate into what we're doing with some reflective, thoughtful, creative spaces for us to be able to engage in. And I just wanted to use the poem by E. Cummings, who I think captures the essence of that. There is no beginning project of person-centeredness. Yes, there is a start point, and we may, we may start thinking about it. Um, and there is no end, because, of course, the end is forever. If we are going to truly sign up to uh, person-centered cultures, it's not a six-month project. It's actually something we are committing to, uh, into how we integrate that into our everyday, everyday being. And last, but by no means least, is the principle of loving kindness, um, which comes back to that idea of how do we actually create more kind, kind cultures. Um, loving kindness is a particular Buddhist meditative uh, approach, uh, which is the idea that you have to love yourself first before you can even begin to love somebody else. And the more you can love yourself, the more you can love others. Um, and the meditation practice goes, goes in that way. Uh, if you heard the song that I walked up to beginning, this is the, the verse from, from um, that song, because it also captures that idea of loving and kindness. Um, because what it's about is that I'm a different person because of the relationship I have with you. Um, and that is the essence of being person-centered, be it at the individual, at the group, or at a societal level. So to conclude, how do we make it more real? And I deliberately say more real, because the reality is there is lots of person-centeredness happening everywhere. Some of it is quite hidden, and some of it is buried, uh, some of it is locked away, and some of it is yet to be known and yet to be seen. And our challenge is to really put it up front, to put it in the foreground of what we're doing, rather than something that, that sits in the background. I would ask you to think about it in the context of all persons, not just about the service users and families that you are, are working with, but what about your colleagues? What about the way you connect with each other um, and show the value of all human beings uh, within, within the setting? We have a huge amount of work collectively to do to change our cultures where we really can value feedback, uh, where we can actually work in a more facilitative way, a more engaging way, a more connected way. That doesn't mean working harder. It actually means just working smarter. Or as Peter Jarvis said, working with the business of practice rather than the busyness, busyness of it. We do need organizations that have person-centered vision. Uh, our experience in our, our action research work is that organizations want us to come in and do person-centeredness, which is the usual line we get. Um, and then they very soon want us to leave and stop doing person-centeredness. <laughs> Um, because actually it starts to challenge all of these things that they don't quite want to be challenged. Um, and we have to really have organizations that are truly signed up uh, to this as a vision, otherwise it's setting people up to fail. Uh, 
Um, and again, at a macro level, we need strategic plans that support it, which in Scotland we are very lucky for, I have to say. Uh, how well they're enacted is a different story, but we are lucky to have them. Uh, and fundamentally, we need to make this the norm. It shouldn't be a project, it shouldn't be a thing, it should just be how we do things, and that's fundamental. And I want to end with where I started, which is that if you are starting to think about person-centeredness in a more serious way, then start with yourself first. Thank you. Or if you feel you're working in a, somewhere where person-centeredness is enabled and supported, then that's be interesting to hear about. It. Question there in the middle. Uh, hi there, thank you. That was fantastic. Um, I was just interested to possibly get an example of where you were, had been asked to, to leave. <laughs> uh, an example of where I was helping you to leave? Uh, to leave, yeah, like, uh, where, where you um, said they invite us in and then said go. Oh, <laughs> uh, I couldn't possibly say. Um, but they, um, uh, yes, there are some around here. Um, but I guess one of the most uh, serious ones, actually, and again, um, this was another one of my doctoral students, and she was based in the Netherlands, and um, she spent two years actually working with a, a, a huge uh, organization, uh, I won't say where it was, and, um, and then started her research work, which was developing a person-centered culture across their renal services. Um, and uh, within two months, having spent two years where they were building it up, wanting it to happen, they asked her to leave. Um, and they asked her to leave because she started to ask these kinds of questions, not just about direct care delivery, um, but it was about the team relationships, it was about the system, uh, it was about the organization, the way they connected with the teams, um, and actually she never finished the research, so her PhD became a study about um, how organizations don't want person-centeredness. <laughs> Which was a great PhD. <laughs> Oh no. It's <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> This is nothing you haven't heard before, honestly. No, so I, I was really just um, thinking, I, I was really interested in your, your slides and uh, being strong and flourishing. Uh, and, you know, we hear a lot about resilience and, and everybody's being mindful and trying to make themselves better and, and all of that. And, and I just, and nursing training traditionally and medical training traditionally has, has emphasized that need for you know, everyone to be strong and healthy. And, and I just wonder if, if, if part of being strong has to be that bit about actually acknowledging one's vulnerability. And vulnerability is the thing that actually allows you to connect yeah. and actually allows you to be strong. And organizations that don't realize that are, are, are missing that whole thing. And so maybe what we need to be focusing on is supporting people to, to recognize their own vulnerability as a positive thing and not a failing, because yep. I, I think that that's something that that lots of people miss and and feel when they feel vulnerable, they think it's something they need to cover up. When actually, it adds to the clinical situation, it adds to the work situation, it, it, it helps the relationship. So I just wondered if yeah, I totally agree, and I'm really glad you said it. Um, I didn't mean to say something about vulnerability, but it kind of slipped away somewhere in the mist. Um, Totally so. There is a fantastic TED talk. I don't know if anybody's ever seen it. Um, it's one of the most seen, most viewed TED talks on the TED system uh, by Brini Brown on vulnerability. Um, and, um, and she makes exactly that point, that until we learn to be vulnerable ourselves, uh, we can never truly connect with other people and we can never be really strong. We can't really hold that strength. And it is something that I think teams and organizations are really poor um, at doing. And it goes a bit back to the poster that won about this idea that, you know, because um, that was my early experience. My first um, proper job leading a, a, a unit, which was a nursing development unit in Oxford uh, at the time, um, and it was about a million miles from being a nursing development unit. It was pretty scary in terms of what was going on, but my job was to sort that out. Um, and, uh, and I remember six months in, standing in the middle of this racetrack of a ward um, and just crying because I was so just so worn out with trying to get anything half decent in terms of care for older people to actually happen. And I remember as I stood there and cried, the ward emptied 
I mean, the, every member of staff disappeared. Um, and they disappeared behind curtains. So I was the manager, the leader, and the lecture practitioner. And they thought, oh, shoot, out. And they were, they were gone. And then from behind the curtains came this one nurse who kind of took me by the elbow and said, you need to come with me, and kind of took me off the ward. And that was the breaking point in the whole change process in that, in that unit, because they could see I was no longer this kind of driver trying to make all of this happen. But I actually genuinely was one of them who cared passionately about the, the um, patients who were using our service at the time. And, and I have these conversations with people a lot about how do they make themselves vulnerable in a situation to actually really understand what it might feel like. How do, you, how do you actually hold that and how do others support you in doing that? But Because it is that that does make you strong. Um, and uh, it, we have a huge amount of work to do in it and I completely agree. It's not through a kind of a superficial approach to things like mindfulness and resilience and you know, sending people on a half day resilience training really. Um, you know, it, it, it just doesn't hit the mark. So we, have, we need to have big conversations about those things I think. So thank you. That's enough to kill a conversation. So. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs>